Ropecón. Welcome everyone to the Premium Human Interest Panel in Robocon 2016. Uh, welcome to Passion and the Industry. Uh, we have a esteemed panel of game professionals discussing why they follow their passion to industry, how does it work in the industry when you're passionate about your work, what's the bad side of the passion, is the work ever boring even for a second, what are the ups and downs of working in the game industry. My name is Markus Mongola. I currently work at a mobile games company called Reforged Games. You can see the Sith Lord there is my boss. <laughs> uh, pre before that career I was a game scholar, but primarily I will be focusing on moderating. At the far right side we have we have Villa Borva, uh, the founder and owner and the impersonation of Burger Games. <laughs> I believe in this group he is best known for Frider and Stalker, but he also has a long career writing and designing games mobile games and PC console games. I think Alienation is probably your last, latest launch title with your stuff in. Yes, actually it is. Then we have Eric Korhonen, who is uh, most recently worked on Quantum Break and Remedy. Uh, her career comes from, I think, Booga originally, the mobile and social games giant from Germany. Then we have uh, Tuomas Pirinen, uh, in this room probably best known for his work at Games Workshop, especially Mordheim, but also other games. Uh, from which he, he went on to work at EA and other massive console PC game giants and currently is my boss at Report Studios working on mobile games. <laughs> then we have Karolina Korpo from uh, Tampere Coastal Order Studio, the lead designer of, of uh, City Sky, Cities in Motion Skyline. Uh, very successful uh, city simulator, the, the, the next step in the evolution of SimCity in practice. Uh, super successful and, uh, and super nice game. And finally we have the guest of honor, uh, Ross Watson, whose track record is very long, but uh, especially he is best known for his work with the Warhammer 40k role-playing games, uh, also the, the Star Wars role-playing games, and also he's been working at the console games industry uh, for quite a long time. Fine. So 15 years of game design experience there. 16. 16. <laughs> so, I... So, Ross, if we start with you and, and go a little bit around, what drove you into game industry? Like, we all have this passion for games, but what was the game you wanted to make, and have you been able to do that game actually? Uh, and, and everyone in there, please feel free to interrupt each other. <laughs> this is Thunderdome. Uh, I don't know if there's any one game that I wanted to make. There's probably like ten games that I wanted to make, and I got to make a couple of them. I haven't made all of them. If I make all of them, I will stop. I will probably be done. Uh, I would go, go write books for a living or something. But um, the the game that got me going and started in, in my industry is actually Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, Gary Gygax awoke this love inside me for creativity and solving problems and doing it in a context of a game. And before that, I didn't know what I wanted to do. Uh, but after Dungeons and Dragons, I knew that I wanted to be a guy who created games that connected with people somehow. Have you been able to do that? Yes, I think so. I think I think many of my games I've been able to uh, give people an experience. Like in Rogue Trader, the experience of exploration and freedom. That's what that was about. Because games I wanted to make, Ultima 5 for instance, <laughs> they don't make that kind of games that many anymore. And now they, when they do, they're quite different. How are you? <coughs> How about you, Carly? Isn't it Well. I've always played games, and I think as a child I, I didn't even realize that you can actually like make a living making games. So uh, it was uh, for me it was kind of a lucky find that you actually can even in Finland live just by making games. I've been in the industry for about nine years now. I started out as a um, as a game tester actually. I was testing mobile games before on the iPhone, so it was a bit different. So, um, but back then I was just, I was uh, studying to be uh, an artist, a graphic uh, designer, and needed some kind of a place to do my uh, traineeship. And then I found that I could actually go and play games all day long, from six months, 
I'm so incredibly ancient that the, the, the wasn't really any career, dream of a career in game. To me, it's always been more of a compulsion. The first game I published was when I was six. I just always written games, and they, they, that was sent to some hey, kiddies little magazine in Finland, and they printed it. But the point stands. It's the, I started very young, and I always made games. And to me, it, it's so integrated into my personality. I mean, Tunnels and Trolls, Dungeons and Dragons. It's the, the, at the very early age, were huge influence in the old, old, Ultima series. It's a massive impact on me. Uh, but to me, it's interwoven into my personality that I do it for a living. It's kind of like it's like breathing. I just can't imagine I would have ever done anything else. I mean, even when I was working in the, as an engineer in the Finnish industry, it's the, the only thing I thought about was games. It was just a way to be able to pay bills so I could play more games. So. And also, while we're making games at Remedy, you make a game about the toilet empires. <laughs> yes, yes. It's the, the little known gem. It's the where the Remedy staff fight each other for the possession of making the, the finest uh, uh, toilet and fighting against each other with things like thermal flare weapons. <laughs> I think that says a lot about you. <laughs> How about you? I rest my case. <laughs> well, what was your dream game and have you been able to do that at Wuga and, and, and Remedy? Uh, I think my dream game was something that would combine story and humor. So I really loved, when I was a kid, I loved Final Fantasy games, but I also loved Monkey Island games. And I was hoping someday to do something where like the story would get shaped by you. So something like uh, Emergent Games, there's sort of an emergent story in the games. And I also love like meta jokes, so I think my like my dream game would be to make Portal, but that's already been done, so <laughs> um, a time machine, that's why I was working on Quantum Break, but that didn't work out. So. <laughs> but now I'm situated at Remedy, which makes story during games, so I think I'm in a good position to make it something. Good. Well, you have to remember that in 2004, when I got into the video games industry, the mobile games industry, I mean, I mean, JP Remedy games, uh, it was just a time when other Finnish uh, role playing game authors were basically sitting at risks for getting real jobs and that kind of stuff, so I was the only one left. And I had never done uh, digital games before, before, but basically my role playing game books were my pedigree and seen me for getting into the most early mobile games industry. And uh, I've been working for most of them for mobile games ever since. And actually, there is a dream game that I got made uh, back in Romulo long before the Angry Birds days. And it's called Wolf Moon. And it's the first uh, first person, well, I would call the shooter, but first person view was game, uh, at, at, adventure game as such, ever published for J2ME phones, and they prepared mobile games in general. And uh, it won every possible award that was possible to win that time. And then again, it's a J2, J2ME game without a lot of brand powers, and nobody bought it. <laughs> <laughs> can, I, can I, would, would it be authentic to ask anyone to try this game? In the audience? Wolf Moon. Wolf Moon. Wolf Moon. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I'm going to find a question of weird one. I mean, the, to me, my dream game changes. And when I was working on Need for Speed for EA, I wanted to make the best possible street racing, racing game. And I feel like I kind of managed that. It's the thing. But then again, some days you want to do strategy games, other times RPGs. I don't think there is just one game. And there's an Arab saying that make all your dreams come true except one. It would be horrible if I did a game and I never wanted to do another one. That's actually something I was I was coming into because then I was working at a company called Boomod when we were making action RPG for a while. And I never really liked action RPGs, but after a couple of months of doing an action RPG, it, you really start to like it. So, so those of you who haven't been able to follow your original passion from the games you really wanted to make originally, have you been, like, other than Thomas, have you been able to create a new passion? Like, I really like racing games now. Well, I can say that I always thought that I hated Sims. <laughs> <laughs> After a while, hey, it, it is a nice game. I found some improvements I could make, and then we made Skyrim. <laughs> that, that's all, how, how did you make that journey? Can you tell us something about, like... Oh, well, well, as a game designer, I think that my what I only need to do is that I can design any kind of game, kind of like Thomas said, that you, you it's a challenge. You, you get the game, so like someone else, like, can you do this? And I'm like, of course I can. Like, I'm a designer. I can design stuff. That's what I 
many, so I, I met so many designers who are like, well, I don't want to do it, I need to play games, they are so, so boring, and they, they are not games at all, and I feel that that's not the way to go. So as, as with any kind of project, when, when we started to make Skylines, I was like, well, I have to go and play Singly as much as I can, check out all the other titles. I actually had been playing most of the CRM City Builder series uh, a long time ago. I think it's the, the game series that I've been playing the most in my whole life. But I still thought that the city building games are kind of like, well, they are not that game-like. They are more like a sandbox and it might be something that I, I would not enjoy. But after some hours with SimCity, I actually I had to play the newest one. That was sad. <laughs> and all the other ones are really nice. So, so kind of getting into it, uh, basically games that sell, they have something good in them. They, they might not be my favorite games, but they have a good system because otherwise people wouldn't be playing them. So as a designer, as anyone who is interested in what the game is about, you just have to go and play and understand what is the point of this, why do people want to play this one. Even, even if I hate it, they have something that they want to play with. So kind of when you find that, that's, that's the magic. That's what you have to do. That's what you have to have your head when you do something along the same lines. I, personally, I actually, you, you definitely should hire Carolina, not me, because if I had to make, I was working at a company called Housemark, and they made a game called Resogun, which is a bullet hell game. And I love the game, it's actually really nice, it's the nicest bullet hell I've ever played. But, but if I have to talk with the designers of that game, I don't even know where to start, because it's so visual, it's so dynamic, everything is moving, and there are so few rules, so few hit points in that game. It's, it's, it's completely different art, in my opinion, than designing, uh, designing, say, a miniature game, or something like that. Well, you never know where inspiration will come from. And I think one of the things that Carol, uh, Carolina said that was great was you should go out and play a lot of different types of games, even ones you don't enjoy, because there's something there that will inspire you. You will learn something from it. Maybe you'll learn that you really, really don't like this game. <laughs> but maybe you will also learn why. And maybe that will inform you as to what you can do with your own game to make it more what you want, even if that's all you want. So can you, can you give me a game you hate it, but you learn from? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I do not like card games. <laughs> not at all. But a friend of mine said, you really have got to try to play Sentinels of the Multiverse. Has anyone played Sentinels of the Multiverse? Yeah, that guy. Okay. I have. That guy. Okay. So it's a cooperative card game. And I didn't know there were such things. I thought it was all deck builders. I thought it was all Magic the Gathering, you know. And this was a cooperative uh, card game. And I learned, first of all, I learned that I loved Sentinels of the Multiverse. But second of all, I learned that um, card games don't have to be one thing. They can be many things. And I started to adapt that to a lot of preconceptions that I've held about different styles of games in the past. And I started to see ways to take something that I thought was a game that I thought was a particular way and make it something that I would like. And that's what I learned from the you know, Make it cooperative. Make it a different type of competition. There's ways to do it. Anyone else learn from the games they hate? I, I want to mention one because has anyone played Kim Kardashian Hollywood? Oh yeah. <laughs> Because I, I had to go on for a very long time before I found another game designer who had tried the game. And it's like, it's one of the most successful games uh, of a few previous years. And it's like, come on designer, why don't you play this? It's, it makes a shit ton of money. Of course you want to know why it works. And it's like, it's made mostly for teenage girls, and it's perfect for them. It has all the elements needed, and like, um, they have done an awesome job at finding out what, what the audience will actually like. Because it's, it's made especially for a certain audience. Teenage girls will like Kim Kardashian. And then you have to find out what else they want, what, what do they want to actually do with their phones, and how can you put Kim Kardashian in all of this stuff. And, and it's the perfect game. It's, it, it sells, uh, it works, it has many players. It actually has playable elements, and it, it has stuff for you to do. It's not boring. It sounds super boring to just have Kim Kardashian in a game, but it isn't. Hi. <laughs> I have a confession to make. Uh, for the last five years, I've been a freelance game designer. So I basically game design mercenary, selling my services to the highest bidder. And surprise, surprise, it is possible to live this way, at least in Finland. <laughs> And this means that I do whatever the customer tells me. <laughs> whatever. So therefore, I have been learning how to, 
how to enjoy basketball manager games. <laughs> uh, why it's a very cool thing to dress up your doll with the latest fashion. <laughs> and why, for example, the Ferrari cars are so superior to all other forms of Formula cars, even though the sports news argues otherwise. <laughs> That's the point that sometimes when you work as a game designer at its work, you don't get to follow your passion. You have to take someone else's passion and try as hard as you can to make it your own. I had to research uh, Facebook games uh, for the uh, Wooga game, the competitors of the Wooga game we were making, and they were basically early prototypes of Clash, uh, Clash of Clans, and they were really shitty at that time, like Backyard Monsters, and it has anyone played Backyard Monsters? Um, I hated that game with like blood coming out of my eyes because it was so ugly. And I later came up with the pieces that it was ugly because it wanted to keep casual players away. <laughs> it was only for hardcore people who did not care about the pretty UI or graphics. And then I was like, this is my job. I get play, play I get paid to play these shitty Facebook games and I'm gonna fucking do it. <laughs> but that's a, that's a question. Do you think it's more of an advantage when you're passionate about the game genre you're working with, or when you're able to have a little bit of analytic distance because you hate it. Which, which one is better for your craft? I think you have to see the both sides. Like, while I was hating it, uh, it kind of clouded my judgment to see how, why people liked it. But when I kind of took the step back and looked at the forums, how people really got into it, got really pissed off about the tiniest changes of maths, and that I kind of like trying to get into that mindset, even if I. It, had to kind of like watching sports or drinking beer or whatever it took to get me in that mindset of that game where I imagined to be target audience, then like I have to see the both the hate and the love for me. Also, I don't think it's a, 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 a static thing. It's the, my mentor, Rick Priest, who taught me game design, is the, he made me a game I hated, and he quoted himself and said, Obedient slave learns to love the lash. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't like puzzle games before I played uh, Puzzle and Dragons, which is one of the top three best games ever made, in my opinion, and they, they are good change. It's the, the, it doesn't mean if I start by hating say strategy games that I would never learn to love them. It's the, we, do, we change, it's the, I do. But it is absolutely true that if you hate the game and you force yourself to play it and try to understand why is it good, especially if the game is uh, demonstra demonstratively good, uh, then that's the game that you learn most from. Because that's the new thing, that's the new territory you can explore. At, at Reforge we have this, this principle of playing mobile games all the time, basically. And I, I gotta say, one of the worst parts of my job is sometimes the games I have to play. I think Kim Kardashian was actually fun and funny, and it was it was sarcastic and ironic, and it was well well written. But some of the other stuff I've been, especially the Sith Lord Thomas here has been making me play. Learns <laughs> 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 to love Kim Kardashian. Um, one of my favorite game jams ever organized was was with the theme. Fuck this game jam, where every team had to come up with a game in the genre they hated the most. And apparently they had a lot of dress up games. Funny. I, I to celebrate that game jam I actually played uh, dating Justin Bieber. <laughs> it, it's basically a, a three penny a browser game in which you make fruit salad for Justin Bieber and you dress yourself up and I think you get to also dress Justin up for the date and, and then you have to finally in the in the date part you have to answer some quizzy quest questions about Justin that and sounds like you're actually being his mom <laughs> Uh, <laughs> I, I separate the, the, if you want something that disrupts, if you want to create a new genre, like something as outlandish as War Fortress is the, I don't know if anybody else knows it, but <laughs> it's the, that game could have only come out of fashion. You do not make a game about wall sticking tunnels with real life physics in ASCII unless you have passion for that. I think you can make good games by applying yourself professional, but I think every game that became a great when changed in the industry. Those have all come out of passion. The, the, I, I think there is a difference what we are looking for in today, but yeah. the, the, yeah, the, and also no professional will pay you for a game that has never been done. Yeah. Well, I, I just was a, I was just a judge actually for the D Infinity Independent Game Awards, uh, which is all tabletop. It's all uh, board games, card games, and role-playing games. And there was a couple of products that I judged in this contest that you could tell. One of the things you, you could see as a judge was the amount of passion put into it. 
there was a palpable sense of someone saying, I love this game, and they poured it into every aspect of the rules and every aspect of the writing, and it was even there in some of the artwork where they had gone that extra mile. And you can, it, it, it kind of makes an impact on the end product if you really, really, really love it. I think that's, that, that's what you're saying in a way, too. So, so, so this question is especially to those of you with lots of titles under your belt. Which title did you have the most fun working with and why? Mordheim, all the fish. <laughs> working a dead fish on every page and every rule somehow. <laughs> <laughs> Sure. 
And then there are the days where they say to you, hey, have you come up with a name for that guy who rides the spider in the arena? I'm like, he rides the spider now? When did this happen? <laughs> He was a knight on horseback. No, he rides a spider now, and we need 30 names for a knight on a spider. <laughs> okay, I, I guess. I mean, it's not as drudgery as an Excel sheet, but it was it was weird. <laughs> was it boring or painful? <laughs> Both. <laughs> Can you think of 30 names for an arm blade? <laughs> no comment. <laughs> <laughs> what if somebody who runs a company maybe a, a completely new layer of boring comes with bureaucracy instead if you know that the TBR you miss their payment instead of going into barriers they move it straight into a collection set still and your credit rate is shot and they were paranoid about the missing a two cent payment somewhere <laughs> if you wake up uh, up at night. That's boring. <laughs> at least that was what you did for something to do with games. <laughs> also meetings. You get called into a meeting, you get no idea why why you're even there, and you're kinda of like, I can't sleep out now. <laughs> do you work with the Swiss? <laughs> They're gonna love their meetings. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the point is to uh, they don't have um, they don't actually make up their mind about anything. No decisions are made. They, they are absolutely horrified when things come in up and we are like, okay, we have a problem, let's do this on this, which one? And they are like, can we talk? <laughs> I mean, it's there. It's let's discuss. We have to discuss for hours and then the right solution will arise. <laughs> That's what we will do. And then hours just eating full up in the meeting and drinking coffee and talking with the Swedes. And then nothing might be decided. Yeah. If, if the solution doesn't just magically appear, we don't decide it. It's your turn. No such thing as free pull up. <laughs> I can actually connect something that Ross was saying with something Eri was saying, and connecting stuff is always really cool in panels, so I'm going to do it. I had to rename, uh, name uh, 200 magic items once upon a time, a couple of years ago. So what I did, actually, I did an Excel sheet that, that automatically looked the stats they were giving, and then created like names like of fire, of flames, of, of, of cinders, of <laughs> to, to, and, and ring, and hat, and gloves, and you know. Because we spend a, spend a lot of time naming stuff. Yeah. Just just look at the board of Warcraft and try, try to figure out how many items there are. And someone has named all of that. And, and we are uh, we are luckily the designers compared to the people who have been localizing that stuff. To find <laughs> <that stuff. laughs> well, but but Stevie, you can make it more fun when we were doing hero quests. We had to do these enormous uh, tables where you wrote the names, and we tried to sneak in as many naughty ones as possible. <laughs> The, the name of magic book, Windy, that's cool, it's gonna be something like Pig, and then Windy Pig. <laughs> so you can make, you can, you can fight the board. <laughs> there is a fine line between boredom and frustration, uh, but the line is there. So there are definitely cases which are boredom, and there are definitely cases which are frustrating. And where the games of me myself, typically I'm a subcontractor coming into a project where, for example, they want to conceptualize something, not a concept level, but they don't have a single person who can actually document anything, so therefore they're getting outside help like myself. And then, at this stage, it would be really useful if the client would know what they want. <laughs> but if they bring me in, and the conversation about what is this product we are going to make is still going on, and then I have to watch basically the media discussion happening from participants all over the world, possibly eight hour time difference in between, and then from that piece together what it is that they actually want to do. <laughs> and they ever tell you that they don't know what they want, that they don't want that? <laughs> I actually haven't had those exact words said to me, but the, the effect is there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, personally, I've never had to deal with doing an expensive IP, but I love this story my friend told me once. He was making a mobile game for Twilight. Ooh. And, 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 Obviously, he loved the thing, and he had to read the books, and he had said that reading those books was the most painful part of his game. <laughs> and they, they came up with some game where you, I don't know, run and run and jump or whatever, and this was sent to the IP holder, and the IP holder said, this is not okay, can you come up with a new concept? And they did another concept, I don't remember what it was, something with luck and dice and shit like that. And that was also not okay, and they, they made a couple of concepts like this, on and on and on, and nothing was acceptable. And finally, they asked, like, why are these all things bouncing back and 
Apparently the author is a Mormon and they don't like games of skill or luck. <laughs> so, so they made a quiz game about what? They, they also believe that the, 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 the paradise was in where? Tennessee? I think so. Yes. I don't know. Yes, I don't know. Yes. Never been there. Have you guys been working with IP and has it been a great thing or a horrible thing in terms of passion? I mean, at, at Games Workshop, of course, you've been able to shape the IP to some extent. Well, but Lord of the Rings was a different one. It was Lord of the Rings, and you get to see Peter Jackson jump up and down like a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't miss that full world. It's the, uh, it was more sort of in the big companies like EA, where the, EA, uh, the IP, like me, was big. One to two billion dollars of profit was guaranteed every year. So hundreds of jobs rested on it, and the deal was six billion dollars mansion. <laughs> not yours. It's the, the, those were very stressful, and the, 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 especially if there was no book to follow. But you had to create a book that the, the, everybody else had a say in it. That was it. I think there's a sense of pride that comes working with an IP and getting it right. Like I can say that Edge of the Empire is a very Star Wars game. Star Wars guys liked it, it's very Star Wars. Star Wars fans liked it, it's very Star Wars. We as creators, we love, we have passion for Star Wars, and we made it the Star Wars game that we wanted to play. So when somebody plays Edge of the Empire, I feel, uh, I feel surprised that it is actually a Star Wars game. It is not, you know, just a layer of Star Wars on top of some other game. It's a Star Wars game. So that's how I feel about it. Is like you can, you can feel good that you lived up to that challenge, that standard of the idea. Well. I am incredibly proud for having worked on that uh, Burnout Mobile game. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably the biggest single IP I've actually worked on. I think the weirdest IP that game developers have to work with is cars. Because when you have real cars like Audis and Volvos in, in your game, those are actually IPs. And it's always a little bit random who pays whom for those to be able to use. But, but the fun thing is that those cars also come with strange things attached. So someone was telling me a story, they were making a car game where everything was basically exploding and crashing and, and, and being destroyed. Except the interior of this our car, which you can never damage because our car is safe for the driver. And, 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 and I can't imagine what would stifle the passion of a, of a game maker as badly as that. Like, we want everything to explode except, except for the, I don't know. Being there. <laughs> And also guns. If you use real guns, those are IP attached. Oh, quantum, yeah. quantum Break having all those guns. Apparently, some people care really a lot about the nitty gritty details of those guns. Even though you're with third person, you basically almost never see them. We need for speed when we are trying to Volvo into the game, and they have a rule that the, the, a Volvo cannot land on its roof. And since it was speed is a game where you crash cars as much as possible and drive them down a, a mountain, <laughs> we have to make a physics so that people can catch. So the whole rest of the car was a one crumpled piece of metal of nothing. <laughs> 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 and its windshield would be perfect. And then we decided we're not going to do one point. <laughs> But never mind the cars, have you worked with the drivers? Well, in Need for Speed, there was one line, the car is the star. We didn't even model the car. Well, World Rally Championship, the Sebastian Lueb edition, <laughs> which I have some personal experience with. <laughs> um, Sebastian Lueb uh, is very passionate about things, but the games are nothing to do with uh, He's very passionate about the cars, and therefore, when somebody unfortunately acquired uh, the thing to do a licensed mobile game using Sebastian Loeb's name in it, Sebastian Loeb immediately turned into a game designer. <laughs> and that's what kind of car game, car, car game he wants to make. And it's a kind of car game that has all the little things he likes to, likes to fiddle in real rally crossing cars. And that meant that if we would have actually then finally made the game, it was cancelled eventually, it would have had like something like 1300 uh, variables and modifiers to the car performance and chassis and suspension and whatever. And he was constantly emailing us these concepts back that he wants to add these and these things and then these and these things. Usually around 50 at a time. <laughs> <laughs> and 
that's my experience of a big name in IPs. <laughs> but but I guess I guess that is part of like if, if we if we go a little bit back to the studio life, that is part of the studio life because everyone in a good team, everyone is passionate about the game. And then you end up in the situations where everyone has an opinion and everyone wants this bell or whistle in or that bell or whistle out of it. And, and you have to negotiate your colleagues' passion all the time because, you know, I have this perfect idea of a car game and, I, you know, I have this different idea and I want to shoot stuff and whatever. How, how does it, like, do you have, what are your most prominent experiences of, like, the conflicting passions about the games? How do you solve them? How do you manage this? Because let's face it, there are easier ways to make, like Thomas used to do, I usually said, there are easier ways to make a living than making games. So we do these games because we like to make games. And the problem is that when you, the team is motivated by their desire to make this awesome game happen, then you have to suddenly become their therapist. But I think there has to be somebody as the vision holder. It's the others maybe part of it and support it, but at the end of the day somebody has to put it forward. I mean, Andy Chambers is the leader of 40K and Star who also works for us in the report. It's the, uh, the uh, Battlefield Flop, Battlefield uh, the Gothic, the grandfather of all space game games. And it got canned three times by the bosses. And it was like a boxing match where the guy gets I'm old and the blood comes out, but Andy would get up and pitch the game again. <laughs> eventually, ever four times and he got it through, and it became a classic, and it, they now play as a PC game. So, and it does, I think, need somebody has to drive the process. It, it, it's very difficult for a lot of people to pull even at the same direction at the same time all the time. That's my my feeling that the, the problem, even if you have people who are capable, they might not be in position in the company to to pull the switch. We actually have a system for this because um, we work with a publisher and usually what happens is like they tell us that would you like to do something along these lines and then we're like yes it's some like game that we could make and that we like and then we get to actually talking about what the game would be about, what kind of a game should it be, when should it be finished, how big of a game is it. So, so this means that even in the beginning we don't have this one person coming up, up like let's make this game. So what we actually have is uh, game pillars. So we come up with like three to five uh, statements that, that describe what the game is about. So for Skylines it was like, um, it's, it's less hardcore than the Cities in Motion games, but more, more hardcore than the latest SimCity. Uh, it's about the city and not the citizens. And that we don't want realism to be, be the main thing in the game. It is, it's a game, it's not an actual simulation of reality. So anytime someone came up with an awesome idea, because that's what happens when you make a game, you're trying to go to sleep, then you get the best idea ever. <laughs> then you write it down, next day you go to work, you tell the other guys like, now I came up with the best idea ever, let's make it. And then what we would do is actually to compare that idea with the pillars of the game. Like, does it fit this game? It doesn't match all of the pillars. If it doesn't match one of them, it might still be okay if it has something else that's only valuable for the game. Creates a lot of content, makes makes uh, lots of things for the player to do. But usually if it doesn't fit the two of the pillars, it's not for this game. It, it might be an awesome idea, but for some other game. So we have an actual system to make sure that the, the stuff we put into the game fits the concept, so that we have a nice package and not this pile of nice ideas that goes goes all around the place. Because that's what happens when you have teams working on things. And we do do discuss a lot of what what would fit the game, how how do things actually fit together, how much stuff we can add, do we have time. But uh, the pillow system is really good. I think it would work also with role playing games really well. Basically, anything that you do uh, with a team, if you do it by yourself, then it's not what you know. But if you have other people, they might not know. Then you have the pillow. Any other ways of solving the creative conflict besides coming up with an early vision statement and then sticking to it? So, it's what, what very are, hard. You just have to like wear them down with the logic and discussion. <laughs> no, I think I think the two best ways to go are just what was mentioned: the vision, you know, having a strong vision, having a decider in place, someone who can say, "Okay, but we're doing this." 
quite a lot of passionate opinionated people have let them fight it out on the last man standing. <laughs> <laughs> so, so can any of you share some of your dead darlings? Some stuff you really wanted to put into your games, but that didn't fit the vision in the end? That you had to leave at the floor of the cutting, cutting room? I, I wanted to have a um, subway system that would visually look like a subway map. Like when you go to Lon London and you have the subway map, and it would look like that, but on the, on the actual game map. But how can I mix it? No. <laughs> so it, it didn't happen. That's the usual way of solving creative conflict. A coder says, nope. <laughs> <laughs> although, although we usually work as a Kanakanam and design of pairs, and my Kanakanam says, no. Background, 
uh, history, for example, let's say alienation. Uh, the stuff that finally ends up into the game, how would I say it's a reflection of a shadow in a very long way, long way in the <laughs> original written? I, I was just playing alienation, a really good game, it's right. And I, I, I was wondering, I wonder what Villa was doing those couple of years, because there's not that much text in this video. <laughs> Truth be told, though, as, as a designer, I, I sometimes point up the trash can between me and me and my colleague Jonna and say that's my client, client because much of the stuff we design, we design for the trash can. Because we have to make five different control schemes to pick one, or we have to create entire meta game branches that are all completely cut, and we never see them implemented. And that's one of the frustrations, of course, because sometimes you love something and sometimes you don't. Of course, then those things turn into these zombie features that come back in the next game. And the next game, until finally I can slip that feature I love into something, somehow, in some form. Well, the upside for the writers is that even though 90% of that material is never shown to the public, it still informs the designers and the whole team what they're making, and it kind of helps create that world, even if you don't see it. Like, it might inform, like, little background cards or how how the city is laid out or things like that. It does in a good studio, I mean. Yeah. Are you good to <laughs> <laughs> you say something about how smart uh, No, no, I'm talking about digital. <laughs> um, one of the things about fashion is, is we are all worked on game design. And, and one of the things in, in, in games is that people play games very passionately and then they go into game company and they are really passionate about their game. And from here, there's a really short lead to the fact that everyone's a game designer. And every game designer is passionate about their game, and suddenly you're in a situation where you have about 20 game designers in the game, including the metal management, as I like to call it. Uh, how, do you, how do you deal with that? That everyone in the team has a passion for your job? <laughs> like, this is my chair and everyone also wants it. Kind of. do, do you face issues with that? Or do you, can you manage that with ease? I'll try to harness that. If somebody wants to do design, it's the idea of the boring bits I don't want to do. <laughs> uh, I think it's good if everybody wants to be a designer. It's just that the, the, you, everybody can't be the game mechanics designer or the meta game designer. I mean, if somebody wants to design the whole chart of the content, however, it's, there's usually very few volunteers. <laughs> so I can, I can direct people towards that. I, I think this is in such a problem with small teams, because we have 16 people, so basically everyone sees how many Excel sheets I go through mm -hmm. in a day. So kind of the, there was the understanding of being a game designer. This is what the, the people talking on forums about the game, this is what they don't get. That it's not like I come in and be like, hey guys, I came up with this awesome idea for a game. Could you make it for me? Then I just put my name on the cover, it's my game because the idea is mine. I'm a designer because I've got this idea. It's, it's actually about all the flow charts and the Excel sheets and, and writing stuff and all of this. So, kind of, we all know that in the team, everyone has the bottom bits, bits of uh, their own, own work. So, being a designer is one job among the other. But we also do, we brainstorm a lot because the, the way I want to work is that. We bring in everyone who wants to participate in, in kind of ideation and coming up with stuff for the game. Then I have a huge list of things we could do, then I choose from those. So everyone has a chance of their idea actually making it to the game. In some ways in tables of games, of course, you usually have one designer, and there is really nothing between you and the, the facts. So this actually works really well because then you're putting yourself into line. In that it's, it's much easier. You make a game, you put it out there. If it sells, yay! If it doesn't sell, comes your performance review and goes, right, this game you made. know it sells 10 copies. You don't kind of pay right should I do either. The, the, uh, it, it, it is easier. Uh, on, on that particular problem is easier. Well, I'm currently working in a team that has like nine designers and we have our own areas. So like, 
I don't think many people are studying for my job. It's more like, you know, who can do what? So, um, and I think we have a very good understanding because the bigger the team gets, the more specialized the job gets. And also, art at that point is so swamped. They're usually like, well, I had an idea for this level, and you can kind of go like, you know, yeah, that's okay, or, you know, not. But they don't have time to pester you every day because they're like, I have to finish this level, and I still haven't done the pictures. And, yeah. No, it sounds really impressive, to be honest. <laughs> Uh, I'm always fascinated when I, when I rarely see a organization chart of a big designer team. Like World of Warcraft, they had one designer for every single character class, and then of course on top of that all the loot and all the mechanics and all the PvP and all the dungeons and everything. I don't know how many designers they had, but I, I guess everyone was dealing with a really, really small turf in the, in the project in which it's really hard to kind of get the overall vision of where this entire boat is going, which is of course quite a ch challenge. Yeah, well, I have a, I have a special circumstances usually because I'm a subcontractor, so I'm an outsider in any team I come in. Uh, but I do have a superpower, and that's being able to document things. Because before <laughs> I became a game designer, I was a technical writer for the heavy industries. And this means that I can actually produce written documents of what I'm thinking yeah. and how the posters are supposed to go. And this means that I'm a gatekeeper of the secret knowledge which is passed on to excessive levels of management <laughs> and developers. And nothing goes to them except by me. <laughs> is it a terrible problematic that someone who's not in the room is the documenter? <laughs> like you have to interview people and ask what they've been thinking. How do you get this information? Well, usually, if a person thinks that this idea is a good one, he is not afraid to tell me so. <laughs> <laughs> and then I can evaluate it uh, both with him, and then if I deem it uh, worthwhile bothering other people, then of course there are producers and people who need to basically approve increased features and stuff. And I'm happy to say that those people who have experience of this field, they usually don't make bad suggestions. They sometimes might make suggestions that are not worth the effort right now, but really getting outright bad, terrible ideas, that's usually management stuff. <laughs> I think one, one good way to judge if an idea is good, if you can actually write it down or draw it down, give it to someone else and they understand it. Yeah, being able to communicate the idea, that's really important. There's a lot of times you just get an idea like, I was thinking like we could just have this thing where you just have this like red gun and it gives you an ability to shoot through walls and then you like start writing it down. It's just like, oh, this doesn't make any sense when you actually have to write down how it actually works and it doesn't contribute anything to the game. Well, there is a <coughs> skill on cover which is it's dangerous to also the, the falling the trap where you just follow rules. I mean, I'll pick your character now. Is short, fat guy with mustache, meets the Italian, shoots fireballs, rides a dinosaur, eats pizza. I mean, it's awful pitch, but that's Mario, <laughs> the most successful character ever created in the state. It is also dangerous never to lose on the shackles. I mean, and it's not. This is not science. This is this is art. There is push and pull. It's the sometimes I let my designers do something that I think is just completely back wacky and quite often my punch is right with something brilliant or something. So, so how, how do you get to be passionate about the, the plumber with with who is shooting fireballs and riding dragons? It's, it's, it doesn't really sound like an idea I would sort of easily jump on the same bandwagon. Let, let's make this game, it's gonna be the best plumber ever. He's gonna have a brother in green. <laughs> It, it's so much about the personality of the person who sort of gives you the spark and says that this is going to be the coolest shit ever. Well, let me recontext that for you. If I told you there was a warrior who could stomp his enemies to death with his bare feet, if I told you there was a man with a head so hard he could smash through brick walls and the lead, if I told you this man was so great he faced down turtle demons three times his size, that's a new context. <laughs> That's a pretty good pitch. <laughs> but, 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 he does it all with a smile on his face. <laughs> but, but, love. He does it for love. <laughs> but, but the truth is, no games happen without pitching. And pitching is something we do a lot. We pitch internally, we pitch the team, we pitch the VCs, we pitch the, uh, the publishers, marketing people, everyone. And I think passion is a really big part of that pitching job. Because, because seeing it 
through your eyes with it. <laughs> it, it is something that would actually make me possibly want to invest money in this game. <laughs> I've just sold you a Mario game. Well, you need faith in what you're doing. I mean, making a new game is, especially a new IP or new genre, is jumping out of plane with a bunch of nuts and bolts, no plan to build anything without a parachute, convinced that while you're falling down to your death, you'll manage to put this thing together so that the people that flies and saves your, your company and your friends' lives, it comes out of it. And, and you just leave to make the prop because you get a chance to try to do it a little bit of a way. Next day, the, uh, the pitching is very much, it's a, a, every video game, like you said, you don't understand how anything gets shipped, it's the every game ship is a triumph of hope against reality. <laughs> and sometimes when you jump down that plane and you make the nuts and bolts, the only thing you have is a little scribble of a plane on a <laughs> Sometimes you jump up with blueprints, sometimes the napkin. That's right. Personally, I think that there are now these games education courses all over Finland. And when it comes to game design, I think they teach the wrong things. Because to be a successful game designer, you have to be able to do two things. Uh, explain what you want to be done and be uh, inspiring enough so that somebody buys that same idea as you do. So that's basically uh, writing and presentation skills. And everything else can be done by somebody else. And the programmers are better at that than you will ever be. Uh, the graphic artists are better at drawing than you will ever be. Uh, but that pitching and that uh, presenting the idea to others, that's your job. And that's pretty much your only job. And that's the one thing they don't teach in most of these courses. Yeah, to get them inspired and passionate, if you can. Yeah, it's a really good tool. I was just, uh, like, uh, this spring I was watching some uh, game uh, writing students pitch their ideas to me, and there was literally one guy who had this beautiful green background and some, like, purplish turquoise green text on it, and the whole PowerPoint slide was full of text, and he was reading it verbatim, and I was like, oh. I'm so sorry, but you're not going to be a game designer ever. <laughs> he didn't do it with passion. <laughs> he, he clearly had something going on like in his internal world, but it was not like you know being shown to the external world. I, I start every speech to the students with the same line. It's the, as you are right now, you are all training to become an unemployed. <laughs> <laughs> Necessity is mother of invention is also, I mean, maybe quite frankly, it's the, the alternative of not pitching, not coming up something new, not doing it. Just wait till the clock tickles and your cash reserves are empty and your close to shop. One thing we did as a sort of an internal pitch with one of the games, it, it, was, a, it was a tank game, tank warfare in a, in a city. And we were in pretty early stages of the game, so we didn't have final graphics, we didn't have final sounds. So basically we just took some Conan soundtrack on the background of the battle and we just ripped some images of the internet of, of huge explosions in Hollywood movies and we put that on, on, in, in place of all the 2D art, like people doing games companies. <laughs> and, and immediately the game felt awesome, because it, ha it had Basil Poladuris music that you never get in game games, and it has some kick-ass explosions from <laughs> some, some, that were ripped off from somewhere. And immediately that game became real to us. And then from there on we spent, I don't know, a year or something trying to reach that excitement with our own assets and our, our own stuff, since we had to, like, actually do it then. <laughs> but, but I noticed that a lot of Twitch decks is, is about, like, referring to other games, referring to other IPs, other, like, we want to make this thing that's a little bit like Star Wars, and then you show a Star Wars image on their slide and your, your VCs are invested. <laughs> Do you, do you find it useful or, or, or dangerous? Do you do that kind of stuff? To motivate the team or the, or the externals? Well, well, we don't much do things like that. But one thing I wanted to mention was that since we do simulation games, we, we call them um, like um, semi-heavy uh, simulation games. So they are not super hardcore and they are not casual simulation games. But simulation is it's super safe. The Germans will buy it. It's <laughs> 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 like anything. Talk about they passion. Like sim simulating stuff is um, it, it might not be um, simulation games might not be the 
huge works of art that leave you kind of uh, feeling like you have experienced a, a gorgeous storyline and fun through all of the uh, difficulties as a winner. But um, it, it is sandbox games help you pass time, they make you feel good, you learn things, you you get good at the game, you achieve stuff. So it, it is there are the kind of I'm really interested in cinematic games and storylines and all of this, but to actually pay the bills, civilization is kind of safe. So so kind of choosing the genre you go with, you have to know the audience, you have to know who plays these games, what, what do they like. So kind of trying to combine simulation with something epic storylines, that's really difficult. The Germans won't buy it. <laughs> I tell my own stories when I do simulation games. I have yeah. the citizens of Rossopolis, yeah. and they live in fear of me as a tyrannical god <laughs> who designs their little world. I might like delete their rooms. <laughs> <laughs> and, and this is why simulation doesn't have stories, because you, you as the player, make up the stories, you tell the stories, yes. you have the sandbox, you have the toys, you can do stuff, and then stories emerge. So kind of some journalists are not just fitted for this epic, uh, super kind of uh, feeling heavy games that, that have stories. Others are just playgrounds for the players. So so kind of and those are safer. If you have good um, kind of if you have a nice sandbox with good toys, people will play. Minecraft. Going back to the pitching, what I've always said to the students, I, I go uh, lecture uh, or game designers like pitching. If they do like presentations to, to me, I always give them like pitching 101, which is at least face the audience and don't ever do this. Like, uh, 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 because like just knowing how to present your idea and communicate is like I think like the top one skill. Because like I I failed as a game designer to man convince my team to make my idea and that that's what kind of caused a rift in the team and the kind of like game ended up being cancelled because we didn't have a unanimous like unanimous vision about the game like I wanted to make my game they wanted to make their game and I we could not convince each other that like which one's version was better and that just ended up like killing killing that game and I, I felt that as a kind of low point in my career like you know I did not pitch this well enough you know I failed I did not communicate what was awesome about my game well, that's, I mean, pitching is important, but it's its really a symptom of knowing what your game is about, being able to communicate what your game is about, and, and being able to express that through the experience is that's part of game design. But the pitch, you know, that's where thats where he's talking about, you know, it's, it's like this, but it's also like that. It's shorthand for being able to communicate an experience or an idea. Um, for example, my setting, Accursed, I like to say, it's Hellboy meets Solomon Kane. Right? And I'm just I'm taking two things you already know and putting them together and you're like, oh, but a lot of people will get it. They'll be like, oh, okay, cool. And then I have another thing, if that doesn't work, I'll say it's monsters fighting witches. And everybody's like, ooh, <laughs> right? Like you can as long as you have some kind of really short, like I was taught to do um, you know, one sentence as your pitch if you can. And uh, and just do a nice a shorthand for this is what my game is about. If you can get it, if you can boil down your essence of the game to that level, you actually, that's a good skill. But then it's important that people get that reference, because yes. like, to me, like Solomon came like that, like, blanking. Solomon do. Solomon yeah. <laughs> yeah, everyone knows it. Philistine. <laughs> but the problem is that if, when you use those, you kind of like have to know your target audience, like Japanese might not right. know what those are, so you have to always make sure that when you're using those, like, uh, oh. shorthands, you have Castlevania to... Castlevania means Hellboy. <laughs> part, part of acculturating into being a part of a games company that you, you have to play a thousand games. And, and more and more I noticed that you had, you had to play those thousand games 15 years ago. So we we're talking, like, I was at a work interview, job interview, and, and they asked me for an opinion on, on their game, and I said, yeah, you could have a catapult mechanic like you had in Defender of the Crown. <laughs> and they looked at me with empty eyes, and I was, Oh, it was the game I played on Commodore 64 in the late 80s. So it, it's it's a really good catapult mechanic, and I, if I needed to put the catapult mechanic in, I would look at Defender of the Crown immediately. I think it's it's, it's superior compared to Angry Birds, for instance. <laughs> it's really nice. But 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 I only have this because I was playing those games back then, and it's it's. It's part of being a fashion-driven industry that you have to be, like, if you want to be a movie director, you probably have to see a couple of movies first. 
And I think that's that's why the old old games are so important because they came up with the sort of most like bare bones mechanics. And I notice a lot of games nowadays just go back there, like you know, boring and nostalgia, like Crossing Road was based in Frogger. Yep. The, the, the thing is, is, I know some people who are teaching game design courses come from a university, and they have, I think, 50 or 100 games you have to play to graduate. And you actually have to go into an exam, and it, they, they might ask you how the, how the core mechanics of Pac-Man work. And if you flunk, you flunk. And, and the students don't like playing those games because they are old and crappy. And they, they really have to control that you, you really did play Ghosts and Goblins uh, for, for a period of time. I, I would make my students play Zork. <laughs> At Oregon Trail. <laughs> if, if we move a little bit forward, uh, the, the, the thing with passion is that we, it's also a very negative thing for our industry. Because our fa fans are super passionate about our work and our fans are super passionate about what they think our work should be. So, so have you guys had experiences of that? We all know about the, the raging hordes in the, in the video game industry, but also I, I guess the miniature and role-playing industries have their dealings with fans, so what would you like to tell us about that part of the passion? Uh, there is just, uh, I talked about it in the previous uh, speech I gave in CD while I was making one of the games. There are entire clubs of brain builders who only take one of the chaos tattoos. Now, this is passion. And if you fail these five, sixteen, you're not attacking their every game, you're attacking their identity. Mm -hmm. they, they, they grew up yeah. all this with 20, 30 years of their life. It's, it's so important to them. It's the, but yes, I had my identity stolen, death threats, no still thinking your own was dangerous, but it still feels nasty. It's the, I mean, nothing as bad as the lot of the especially female video game designers that have to endure. But they, they, it's definitely there and the I don't know if passion is the right word. Immaturity, maybe. It's the the uh, uh, the, the, the ill feeling of people. Just the, the, usually, I think people are projecting something else. I, I can't believe that you would be ready to kill somebody because I changed a, a color of a video game character. It's the about they don't make right. It's the about that's generated thousands of people. <coughs> well, that was you. <laughs> 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 I can't believe that's the real ultimate reason. I think there is something deeper in the, the going with those people. Why they, they get so incredibly strong emotional response. Passion becomes entitlement. Yeah. After a certain point. Is this a thing also in table the role playing? Yeah. Oh, yes. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just uh, we just pre released uh, a 25 year old set of rifts into the Savage World system. It's the first time this uh, setting has ever been done in the system other than its original, which was the Palladium system. And whenever, I'm sure anybody who knows different role-playing game systems know that there's a different experience that comes with that. Now, you can take the same world and play it, but you're gonna have a slightly different experience because of the way the mechanics interface with you, okay? But the thing is, these guys that have played Rifts for 25 years, they've played it in one system, and they know how that experience works for them. And they want to tell me, well, how come it doesn't work exactly like it does in my game in your new game? And I'm like, well, it's a different game. <laughs> uh, it just you just don't understand. It's going to have a different experience because the mechanics are different, and they don't want to hear that. They want to hear it exactly works exactly the same. I want the exact same game that I've had for 25 years, but I want it new, <laughs> brand new, somehow. Yeah. How do you manage that? I, I tell them it is a new game. If they like their old game, it is still there. I didn't take it away from them. You can go play that. You know, but we have what we have made is a new game. That the remedy we have the curse of Alan Wake. <laughs> so it's every every time Alan. every time we announce something that we're making something, if it's not Alan Wake two, we have failed. <laughs> we have failed them, and they you know swear and curses that they will never buy anything from us ever again because we have somehow. Betrayed them by not making our way to. So, 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 so how about Booga? When, when you were at Booga, maybe working Facebook games and social games and mobile games, do they also like the casual games crowd? Are they also? Oh yes. <laughs> no. Let me tell you about that. <laughs> so, uh, so Kingsbridge, the game I made, which is now being shattered, the servers have been put down a long while ago, and uh, it was this little like first game I worked on from start to end, and it was. 
this weird feeling when I already left the company, I heard that, okay, the game's going to get shut down. They did a blog post, like, they, every time they show, uh, like, shut down a Facebook game, they warned that, okay, we're going to shut it down in a couple of months. And I started, like, looking at the comments, and there were, like, people who were like, Booga, you betrayed us again, like, we'll never buy anything from you, you're just there to grab our money, you horrible capitalist shits. <laughs> and it was like, okay, you're getting a bit emotional. And then I noticed there was this sort of German fan group, like, they made a little German fan group, uh, and I went to look at it, because the cover photo was that we had these sort of little blue flower decorations, like one tile ones that you could put in your town, and you had these little knight statues that you could also put in. They were purely decorative. But people had made this little, little uh, funeral plot, with it, putting like the knight statues, and put these like, blue crosses in front of them, and put that as their like cover photo. And there was like three thousand people in that wow. group, and I was like, three thousand people care enough about my game, game that they made these little funeral plots <laughs> to sort of protest that we were shutting down the game. The, the, the moment when I felt worst about the Shadows of this, the, the location-based game Shadows of this we made in. in 2010 or something. Uh, when we felt, when I felt bad about shutting it down, was when when I remembered there was this guy who got a tattoo, sh shadows of this tattoo right in the start, uh, and, and I think it was pretty big tattoo. Even after. then we cut the game because it was profitable. Oh, <laughs> ouch! It's gonna be a rare tattoo. Grandpa, what is that tattoo about? <laughs> It's about broken dreams. <laughs> <laughs> the theme of the, the, this con is law and uh, the order and chaos is the law and chaos. It's the, I think the a lot of fans, they, they fell in love with something. DD first edition, squats in one for a game, and they don't want it to change. They want it to remain ever changing as it was. Well, we, we are the forces of chaos. <laughs> we have to go, that's why we get paid. We we'll break things and try to make something new. And it was said like we take all the game mechanics and a lot of the stuff we do is incremental. Like they look at Dragon Age, it gets better every time it's the same game, they just improve everything. It's the, the, uh, but there it will always be people that it was better back in there. And it has to return and stay there forever. But they still want something new for it. Like, yes. Why isn't there something new for this thing? And then you were you gave something new and you ruined it. Yeah. I didn't ruin it by getting something new. But the fact what, what I see a lot um, with simulation game fans is that they like to discuss the game. So some of the games include a lot of waiting, just looking at the airport, city, whatever it is you're simulating, and and that means waiting. And then you come up with these ideas like, what would the other players say about this thing I made? Then they will post it, they will dis discuss it, and kind of some of the negative comments look a lot like these are people who want to discuss uh, some like something about this game. They want to say things, they want to tell tell me things, they want to tell the team things, and the only stuff they can come up with is negative comments. So instead of coming and being like, I like this game, let's talk about it, they will say like. I saw this bus, bus mechanic that you have, and I think it isn't good. If I made a new one, it's here, and please say it's good. And then people <laughs> will come in and, and they will discuss uh, about the mechanic and kind of struggle this uh, a bit negative um, feeling or, or kind of ideas. That's how they feel they're contributing to the community, contributing to the actual game, by finding out something that's wrong with the game, and then they will make it better. And usually what they say with simulation games is that um, I found a bug, this thing is not realistic. <laughs> and then I tell them that it's a game. <laughs> <laughs> but kind of it, even all of this with death points and, and all of this is people are, are into the game. They want to discuss the game, they want to be a part of the community, they want to maybe engage with the developers, but they don't know how. And, and they feel maybe that having a 20-month uh, problem is more valuable than just saying that I like this game, thank you. What, what a funny thing the fans don't understand is that games companies have community managers. And the role of the community manager is not to engage the community. That's what they do, but that's not why they are there. The role of the community manager usually is to isolate and protect the team from the fans. So that there is a face for the company that is not actually the productive people trying to make the next game, but someone who's dedicated at managing the thing that is the community and, and, and keeping those those 
inputs and, and trying to understand those inputs at, at, a, at a broader level so that designers don't need to read endless forum discussions about how everything sucks because that's really de demoralizing. Especially when you make a feature, fix some of their issues and then they get more issues and then, oh my god. So, so let's, I, I guess in this room there might be people who are as, as compulsive or passionate about game as we are. So, so what would you say to, to a typical Robocon goer, someone who's enthusiastic about board games or game masters or plot or makes LARPs or plays them, uh, makes their own board games, something like that. How do you start to follow the passion? What, what are the ways for a fan to, to, to join the industry? What, what's the best path to hone your skills and showcase them? Finish a game and publish it. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of game? Well, no, it kind of depends what you want to do. What, do, you, do you want to get into the video game industry? Try to make a video game. But, like, start small. Make a card game. Make a board game. If you like video games, mod something. Make something of your own, finish it, and put it out. Typically in this industry, we are not really interested in what kind of degree you have. We are interested in what you can show of your past work. And I got my job based on Pryder, the tabletop role-playing game. So, if you can produce something that's you know impressive, that will, that will work, that will impress those people who are looking at these credentials, if you can publish anything in almost any format, that's a big plus. And in my case, since I want to become, become a game designer, or was um, sort of interviewed to become a game designer, having some kind of document that even though it's not digital, they can still show that, okay, there are all algorithms, so there are balance issues, and this thing has been worked out, and it really does work, and it's uh, fairly popular and it's liked. Uh, that's, a, that's, a, that's a very great thing. That's something you can show that you have already done. That's your past experience, and that's how I got into the industry, and that's what we are looking for when we are talking about recruitment of new people. One of the questions I always put into my game designer interviews is that I give you two pages, maybe it's done it, you've done it, it's the, you have to uh, design to me a game with combat mechanics, uh, skill mechanics, world background. It's the experience system, you have two pages. It's the, the, but that's just my shorthand that I wish you did it before. It's the, you need to stop treating your passion as a hobby and start treating it as a job. There's a good book by Stephen King on writing. He just said, I don't, I'm not interested in you if you don't want to write today. You're going to write six pages like you did yesterday and day before that. And it's crap, but it gets better because you practice, 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 practice. It's the, and eventually you will get better and you will get something published, just like the sending state he wants to publish. Okay? I especially appreciate if you get anything in table of game that anybody is willing to pay for, then you've really done something. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why I think having those like, you know, your projects that you kind of like to leave in your drawer is not enough. Finishing it is the important part. Like I know so many people feel just like, I have this thing that I've been working on for 10 years. Maybe one day I'll get it finished. No, finish it. Just finish it. Finish something, yeah. anything, and right. put it up. And it doesn't matter if it's bad. Being bad at something is the first step towards being good at something. <laughs> but you have at least, as Evie says, you've at least done it. I mean, maybe it was bad. Maybe it was terrible. My first thing was bad, but I got there <coughs> because I did more. It doesn't count if it's only in your, if, if it's finished, but it's, it's not published. It doesn't count. Do, would, would you, yeah. if you imagine someone sends you, I made this game, I want to work for you. Yeah, yeah if, it's, if it's done, you know, if that shows he knows his games. Yeah. It counts, but it's a little bit like the, the uh, I go to gym, it's the, uh, somebody tells me that they bench press with their home. <laughs> sure you did. It, 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 there is something, it's like, it's a different thing to do in competition. There is something about going in front of public. Like, it counts, but I think if you really want to make me stand up and take notice, get something out there that people actually care about. Yeah, and then, then you also kind of get to the point where you have to meet the fans, you have to discuss the product you are made, um, and this is something that you will uh, have to do when you actually work in the industry. You will be working on a game, it will be finished, it will, it will be put out there, and people will talk about it. And then when you go in the forums and they tell you you suck, you have to live with it. So if you have done that and you have lived through it, you know that this always happens, then it's much easier. And, and as a person hiring someone, I would know that they, they know how this works. They, they will not be shattered when the first negative comment comes. And that's the people I want to work with. 
and when you publish, put it out there, then you have to do that important part, which is pitching. Like if you put out your game, and next year at Rapagab you'll be selling it, you would have to sell people, like you'd have your little table in the Muthi Alwa, and you'd be like, hey, come and play my game, and I'd be like, why? And then you'd have to prove that you know your idea and why it's fun. So, so Carolina, you're one of the few people I know who have actually done the play test, uh, uh, internal game testing to, through something through something to actually being a game designer. And it's something that a lot of people try to follow. I, I, I knew someone who was a tester at, at Blizzard, and at some point they realized we have a million testers and only, I don't know, 100 game designers or something crazy. Uh, how did that work out? How, how, how could you make the cut? What was the... <laughs> I, I have to say most of it was luck. So I, I would think that many game game testers have the kind of skill set that would allow them, them to do something else also. But then again, a good game, game tester is a person who wants to test games. We just uh, had to hire a QA person whose only job is to test the game and make sure that the testing information coming from outside is actually valid. So finding someone who only just wants to test the game and make it as good as, as it can be, that's difficult. So I was never that kind of a QA person. I, I was a QA person who was hired so that this is a great way to come into the industry and then you can continue. And then I stayed for two years just playing the games every day thinking that when will I be able to actually find a new job in this one. But it, I learned a lot of things. I, I always tell people that if you can't have a testing job for a short time, like two months, something like this, uh, depending on the games, if you test a PC game, you should stay uh, testing it for the duration of, of the project, then it's like two years. But, but that's a long time to be playing one game. But with mobile games, it, it's a shorter time. But then you get to see all of the, um, like the phases of development. So uh, when I was testing the mobile games, we got the games when, when the first prototype was done. So basically when they have something moving on the screen, we played it. And then we told the team, does it feel good? Does it feel like it should? Does it have something that you can actually sell? Uh, does it feel like a game? Does it have the basic concept? Then they worked on it, uh, it came back kind of in the middle of the, the project, so it was kind of finished. They had lots of uh, stuff that had been done, and once again we kind of evaluated, does this feel like the game we're making? And we worked with uh, a lot of IPs, so like Star Wars and all of these big ones, so it was really important to make sure that stuff, stuff looks like it should, it actually works like it should. And doing this, it meant that I got to see how the game actually was developed. We played it, gave feedback, then we saw what had been done and how the game had been worked with since, since that point. And then we saw, of course, the end product, what, what the game eventually became. Uh, sadly, we never knew how much the game sold, if anyone even bought them, because these were the Java games. So, we Bill was talking about, so no one knows if anyone ever actually bought these <laughs> games. But they were made with love, carefully crafted and, and well done games. So testing is, is a good way to get into the industry, but don't believe if they will promise you that. Yeah, yeah, at the end of this project, then you can move on to the next, next stage. Uh, as it, at its worst, game testing is the worst kind of drudgery in the game industry. Because you literally have to play eight hours a day the same game. In 3D games, you're trying to hit your head into the walls. You're basically trying to find a way to pass the wall or fall through the level. And then someone moves one tree and you have to do it all over again. It takes forever for every level. But at the same time, at its best, it's, it's giving real-time feedback to the designers, working with the balance, working with the fun, working with actually a lot of the same things game designers work with. Uh, and also being on top of the product, knowing exactly how everything works and, and everyone is coming to ask you questions, what, which bug, bugs should we fix first? So actually you might end up a producer if you're good at testing. Yeah, kind of how, how I got out of testing was that the company was sold uh, to THQ, who then suddenly decided after a few weeks that they don't actually need a studio in Finland. So they shut the whole thing down, which meant that we had like 40 people in Dunbar who wanted to make games and who didn't have a job. 
So what turns out it was uh, tons of tiny companies. Colossal is actually one of those companies. Um, and Colossal was one of the few ones where people said that I don't want to make mobile games anymore, please. Even though the iPhone just came out, no, we're not going to make mobile games, we'll go with PC. And back in what, 2009, they told us that PC is dead. <laughs> I don't want to play some PC anymore, like you're crazy, mobile is the way to go. But I think they, their opinion has changed. <laughs> I think there's an important point about passion there also, when you run a games company. If you have only people who want to make PC games, and you look at Supercell and figure out iPhone makes a shit ton of money, it still might be the right thing to stick to the PC, for instance, because, because when, when people, for instance, when you have old school designers or old school programmers who don't want to do free-to-play games, forcing them to work on free-to-play is a sure way to fail in your game. One of the things about passion is that we really want our games to succeed. And it's not only about the fact that they look nice in CV when they make millions, uh, and it also that they totally suck when they get canned before launch and your CV is empty for two years, but it's also that we want to deliver the best game to impress ourselves, our fans, our colleagues, and just to make the best game ever. But the downside of that is, is sometimes the crunch, for instance. Where, where, you're, where, where the management tells you that we have six months to finish this game and then we'll finish this and if you want that nice feature in there, feel free to do it over weekends or something. Do, do you ever feel that your passion is or has been exploited in the in industry, by the industry? Well, well we try our publishers to not assume that we will do any more but says on the contract. It, it took them a few years to understand that when we say that we will make this game in this time and with these features, that's what they will actually get. <laughs> because they naturally thought that, yeah, these game development people, they will, yeah, we will just agree on this and pay them the money and then they will make us something huge and fancy. And it's like, no, if you want something more, you pay. <laughs> we, we want to be paid. <laughs> And not just because we're tiny and we want money, it's so we can actually keep making games. Yes. We don't have to burn ourselves out with the game we are making. We can continue making games and we will have money to have more kinds of games that we make. Well, I joined EA in the, the just in the at the throes of the EA spouse scandal. It's the and the difference of course is that in North America, if you're a salary employee, you can be and are asked to do a unlimited number of hours in a in a week. If they say you have to work ten thousand hours today, even though there is only twenty four of today, well within their rights. It's the it's you have you to figure out how to delay the time. Uh, so the the uh, and it's difficult because in EA, it's not publishing work for the man. It's the, the, so you don't have a contract, you don't contract with the, 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 the guy somewhere in Redwood Shores. Um, and it's been bedeviling our industry. It's the, the, some of the games companies I truly admire, like Blizzard, still have what they call a free crunch. You start doing insane hours a year before the crunch starts, and then you really start to crunch. It's the, the, and I think that's very dangerous because it burns out people, the, the average age and of a industry professional is very short. They leave and do something else, especially bad for the technical people. So we're still a very young industry and we're trying to figure this out. At EA, of course, the part of the reason for the crunch is that we need the game out at this day and it has to come out, of course, all the marketing campaigns and the shop promotions have been agreed at that point. And it's FIFA or Need for Speed or Madden. It's such a huge franchise that all hell will break loose. If you, uh, if you miss it, I mean, look at what happened with Battlefield. It's the, the, it was clearly put out before they had a chance to finish everything. We're still figuring it out. I, there has to be another solution, the permanent crunch. But with the, especially the PC and console space, the arms race is so incredible. Like the graphics get pushed, 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 and pushed. That, and it always tends to come out of the backs out of the developers. And there isn't any magic golden bullet. I think it will require time like it did for the movie industry before we sort out inside. Yeah, I think a lot of that comes from uh, the guys in charge, the really high upper end echelon of many video game companies. And I'm not many, many, but there are many video game companies where the upper echelons of people who are making the decisions, they are not gamers. 
They don't understand games. They don't even know how they're made. But they do know they have like a business degree, or they have come from finance. Uh, so they know things like deadlines, and they know things like balance sheets. But when it comes to making the games and what it takes to make a game, they don't know. They, as you say, it's got to come out of this date, make it happen. And that causes, as you say, burnout. And it's, it's, it is a very pernicious problem. And I wish it was that way, as soon as possible. Yeah, during Quantum Break, I did my first like proper crunch in the industry, which clearly shows that I was working on mobile, Facebook before that, and then I joined my first AAA title, and suddenly now I'm crunching. <laughs> I wonder what happened there. There must be some kind of pattern. But yeah, they're tied to that, like, you know, release dates, uh, console cycles, all that. And mobile is much more like, you know, Apple doesn't care when it comes out. One, one thing that makes crunch open harder is that there is less creative work done in the end of the project. It's just endless polish and bug hunt and fixing and putting things in place and all the creative decisions and all the nice things and the, the rock and roll things have been done a lot earlier and then there's just the... Yeah, but there is good crunch and there is bad crunch and I've partaken in both. And in good crunch there is this silent agreement or not necessarily even a silent agreement between developers and within the team that there are these some cool features and we are faced with the choice of leaving them out or putting them in with extra effort. And if we are, if we are passionate about the project and if we do have, if we can see the end, end of the road somewhere, then this is possible to do. You can motivate your team to do a good crunch. And it's also kind of a community building experience and, and it works. But then there's the bad crunch, which is usually mandated by somebody higher up telling that we are going to ship this move this uh, uh, release date two weeks earlier and that kind of stuff that it's not in your control it has nothing to do with the properties or qualities of the game you're not really feeling that you'll be improving the game uh, with this uh, blood with sweat and tears you're pulling off of your backside <coughs> and that really destroys the team it uh, kills the morale uh, and it's uh, and there are um, all of these examples that E.S. Bows and others that have been mentioned. They are basically they build up this uh, concept that there was a time, and I don't know if that still continues that time, uh, that the companies would be engaged in like year-long bad crunches. Some have done that. Some, some people say that 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 L.A.N.O.R. was developed for nine years, and out of those nine, I think five was crunch. Or something. Well, there's a philosophy that I've learned in my game design, and I try to pass it on to as many people as possible. And you would really be surprised how many folks are like, wow, really? That you believe this? And my philosophy is this. A game that is late is only late once. But a bad game is bad forever. <laughs> <laughs> so I would rather be late and make a good game. So I've been having the opportunity to ask this wonderful people question for one and a half hours. And now, before we move to the final, or, or start to end this session, it's the opportunity for the audience to ask questions if you have about fashion stuff. I have a microphone. You had the first talk since I'm already here. I'll let you have first. Hi. Uh, so, first things first, uh, I'm going to again say my opinion. There is no such thing as good crunch. Crunch is always misuse <laughs> of management, <laughs> managing time, and it always stresses people. I don't believe in it. But my other question is, or actually the real question is, uh, what do you think about uh, solo developing and team developing? Like, what's the difference in them? And what's the most important thing, thing in, especially in team development, and why is it communication? Yeah, if, if you're making a game by yourself, you have all the strengths. But what, what the downside is, you can make smaller games, because you just you don't have that many hours unless you make it for like 10 years, but then again, kind of the game, the game concept maybe doesn't age, but the technology will, and if you have to count down the whole thing again and do all the graphics over, that, that sucks. So kind of having the creative team is both, they, they cheer you up, they help you when, when things are hard, you have people who you can share with uh, when, you, when you have feelings about the game. You can talk with them about the game, as, as maybe people close to you might not after 10 years want to hear all of your game talk, but, but at work, that's, you have to listen. So by having, having a social uh, circle of people who, who kind of are doing the same thing, you know that they understand you, that's a huge thing to have. 
and I think that's why many of uh, the solo projects never get finished because you have no one saying like, yeah, we can do this, we, we can actually finish this thing. And, and just when you're in a team, understanding what the others want and negotiating, talking, uh, in kind of expressing what you want and then finding some way to get things done and, and find the middle ground of what you actually do. Communication skills are, are the main thing. I think in solo projects the problem is a lack of feedback. Um, you really easily like voice yourself up and like it's my pure vision, but you don't get feedback from anyone else unless you really have to like take out your fear and take it out there for someone to see it and give you like feedback. For me, it's not so much the communication; it's the culture. Because if the mandate of communication doesn't do anything, but if the company culture is helped us, the need for speed, the core team was me in design, Matt Thomas in production. Scott Nielsen in the senior production, uh, Christian Van Persen from the, 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 the old cast stuff, and we only communicated by insults. <laughs> uh, and we had an excellent spirit, because we came up with new, really horrible things to say about each other in the morning, which meant that the, all the stress and pressure that came from you working on such a big title went away, because the brief officer on how, how can we tell the other uh, guy to sort of the most creative way. And the communication happened naturally once we fell into that. It's this idea because some, some people are not very talkative, so you have to learn other ways to communicate with them. There isn't a one size fits all solution for me. That's why I say the culture, healthy culture of the company, it's a thing. Because then even the quiet guy who never talks, even if you try to pull it out of the employers, if he's part of the culture, then he will he will be the law, he or she will do what's required. Yeah, and, and the right thing. Okay. All right. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, I found out that as a game center, when you start working at the industry, you kind of lose your hobby because you do it as a work, at least at first. And uh, have you lost it? Have you just given up on the hobby and just focus on the work? Or if not, how have you reclaimed your hobby side of the game? I know it's definitely that when I was doing Facebook games, I play Facebook games. When I was doing mobile games, I would play mobile games. Now I'm working AAA, I play AAA. So it, it does definitely shift my like taste or kind of like I have to seek out the competition, seek out the ideas in the medium. But I kind of like, I prefer taking like my hobbies back to role playing and LARPing where I can completely like shut out that critical voice of like, it's become a bit of a work that I can shut out the rule playing alarming. I don't have to worry about, but how does this feel? Like, would this be better? And I, I think this game design decision sucks. <laughs> you can have uh, sustained burnouts uh, for things. Uh, I talked earlier about a curse this project I was very passionate about. I was, I poured a ton of passion into it. And I loved it, and I loved it like my own child, and we made it, and we made it happen, and it came out, and I don't want to play it for probably another six months. <laughs> uh, I thought it was a great idea, and I will probably get back to it eventually, but for now I am kind of, I want to do other things for a while. And I don't think that's a bad thing. I think it's it's fine to put you know something down and come back to it later. I'm sure there were times when two of us didn't want to hear more time ever again. <laughs> but that's I think that's that's healthy. You can, you will eventually get back to and be like, oh, I remember this thing. You will remember the passion you had in it and say this was good. I like this. I occasionally had that problem when I was still working with employers. Uh, employers, but now that I'm sort of freelancer, so every project is different and every working day can be different. And there's no more like one single thing that would be the job and one single thing that then would be the hobby. And, uh, and it's working together, and, it's, uh, uh, and I found it manageable, and it's a good thing. Uh, even if it means that I have to play also the other mobile games that I necessarily wouldn't play on my own initiative, but uh, then I have to learn. And then, of course, uh, I have continued my hobby of writing the pen and paper games. And um, uh, I'm hoping at least, I don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing, but I'm hoping. So the, there are so many different kinds of games, so you can always find something, something that doesn't remind you of work. Uh, I've been playing tons of Pokemon Go. And, uh, <laughs> like, only tiny search. Nice. <laughs> for, for me, like with any tabletop game, some I really scout it. And also because the initial investment is so little, 
I was just playing this game that's about a fantasy professional wrestling. So it's elf wars and monitors, awesome stuff. And the table that you can get these kooky ideas so I can experience new things. Also, something I learned, it's the a, a tip. Everything you do is much more epic and preferable if you put two steps from hell on your Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I agree. It makes life so much easier. <laughs> makes everything epic. Even a pistol. Okay. Sure. So, about the earlier, order versus chaos, like keeping things the same and changing them. Um, how do you feel like the kind of natural evolution of the systems, like in role-playing games, D&D has went through several versions, everyone with different game, but kind of keeping the principle same. It's, I can stop it, Steve. The taste of people have been more and more for more accessible, not necessarily simpler, a lot of times uh, confuse a, a, a easily grasp difficult to master rules as being simple simply because the, the rule book is not billion pages long. It's the, the uh, so the new editions, I mean when they go wrong, it's usually when they change the best things about background in a way you could say that the, the second trilogy of Star Wars that the Lucas made wasn't necessarily the right set. It's the, the, you could say that. You could say that. <laughs> <laughs> but usually the, the other rules change. They they become more accessible, more straightforward. New people are much easier to bring in. And I know a lot of people find it difficult because I, I miss the role of Masters critical tables, but I couldn't run that game anymore. I mean it would take me years to re rememorize. Re all those critical hits, it's the, yeah, which weapon has what it's the... So I think that's the, the what people miss when games move forward. Yeah, video games, I, I think you can easily notice it. In old games, you used to have separate manual, physical manual. If you lost that manual and tried to play it again, you'd be like, this game doesn't have a tutorial, it doesn't tell me how to play, how am I supposed to get into it without the manual? And nowadays games have tutorials inbuilt, it teaches you how to play. You don't need that manual anymore. So I think that's the kind of same, same direction we're going towards. I think we have time for one more question. Well, I was going to answer that last one really quick. Um, I think games evolve, and I think evolution is good. I think there's strengths and weaknesses in any edition of any tabletop game, especially D&D. You can look at any edition of D&D, and I can talk to you about what was strong and what was weak. And I think uh, I like, we all have our own favorite, you know, whatever that one is. There's nothing wrong with that. Fun, you can have fun in many, many, many different ways. And what I find fun may not be what you find fun. Uh, but I think there's always something to look at in any edition and say, you know, that was good. And we talked about this earlier. I could find something that I could learn from or be inspired by. Okay, um, so I uh, study game design in an applied university. So my question is, is it worth really studying uh, and what? like uh, game design, and what can I do to make the studies better? Because as you said before, we don't learn any pitching or other important skills like that. Can I answer this because this is my like, pen topic? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so like, I had that same problem that I basically wanted to get into games, I got into applied, science, uh, applied sciences university, and then I was like, these aren't actually teaching me anything. But what this school does offer you, and it's an excellent framework of like finding an environment where to build games. So you will have all the tools you need. Mostly, if it's a good university, you will have the computers, you will have the software, and around you are people who also want to make games. This is an excellent uh, like ground for you to find a team to make games with. This is, I think, the best part about school: not the paper, but the people and the environment. Very quickly, learn a valuable trade in games design. You're new. You have no track record, you haven't done Battlefield, it's the, I don't know you, learn how to script, do a kick-ass mod in Counter-Strike that I can play and say, wow, this person is incredible, it's the, uh, publish a tabletop game, anything, the, the, the scripting, level design, all these hard, uh, what I call the hard currency skills in the game design, learn something that will make you valuable to me, so I feel like I'm going to take a chance on you creatively, because I, you don't have a track record, but you can show me, it's the, learn something that we can use from day one. And finally, pitching and speaking publicly and using your voice, it can be learned, you can practice it, and you can do that stuff even outside the school. 
I use to make public speak. A last dirty trick network. Get yes. to know people here. Speaking of that, I don't need my heart. Con 